They would take on whatever language was from that area. They would incorporate whatever people were there and bring them into them. And so that's why the Ottomans were really the largest empire because people under the Ottomans did not feel neglected and said, well, I'm not treated as the others are. They were all brought under one huge system. He was called the lawgiver not for legislating laws before his complete revamping of the Ottoman codes of practice to make them user friendly. His methods would last for 300 years after his time. Suleiman al Qanuni also went to Sham and saw Al Masjid al Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock. And every 15 years, he had the walling and the cobblestones demolished and relayed every 15 years because he said there is no reason why these places should not look every bit as splendorous as how we've made Mecca and Medina look there's no reason why they shouldn't look like that right I don't even have to explain to you how pathetic the state of the cobblestones on the way to the dome or Mesut al-Aqsa are where some of our believers have to have their hands out like beggars in order to get it fixed because the Jordanian authorities who don't even deserve mention, have uh, failed to use the money swelling their coffers from the uh, induced slavery they've brought on themselves to the Americans. They haven't fixed it. Also, Suleiman al-Awwal marched in and oversaw the expansion of Ottoman territories into Belgrade, Rhodes, and a huge portion of Hungary before finally being rebuffed at the Battle of Vienna. If not for his being checked, Germany and other Teuton peoples would be Muslims today. So on your flight to Frankfurt, you would have had halal sauerkraut of all types, halal sausages of all types, because they all would have been Muslim. There would have been no Hitler. There would have been no Bismarck. There would have been no Paul von Hindenburg. There would have been no Wehrmacht state. Wouldn't have been any. There would have been a huge Ottoman domain. They were finally checked at Vienna. And I'll tell you why. There are two reasons why. One is Ottomans tended to rely in ground warfare on the use of their cannons. Because they knew that the Christian forces and other armies marched in a phalanx fashion. Several men across, several men deep. They would fire four cannons lined up into the crowd. You're going to win that war because everyone's lined up. And so they're firing cannons four or five times into the crowd. Well, there's going to be hardly anyone left, and those that are left will surrender. And they'll be killed or taken as prisoner or what have you. So they couldn't get the cannons all the way into Vienna because they had to drag them over hillocks and mountains. They couldn't bring them with them. And then secondly, while they were at the gates pounding them down, using battering rams. And what they had done is they'd taken a, a, uh, a bundle of kindling with wood planks, poured oil over it. Yes, they had oil back then. They were using a type of kerosene and pitch. Set it on fire and were ramming it against the gate. So one of two things would happen. They would either burn the whole place down and get inside or bust the door open with this barn buster object, burn everyone in front of the door who was a guard and get inside anyway. And they were ramming it against this massive gate. And a letter comes telling them that some of the local Shia rebels back in their area were advancing on a number of Ottoman provinces. And then all of a sudden, the Ottomans just pulled back. They just According to the accounts of the Kufar, they say that they melted back into the ether of where they had come from. <laughs> Just that quick, they were gone. And, you know, the, you know, one minute, you know, the gate's on fire, it's being rammed. And next thing you know, the fire goes out. Gate's not being rammed anymore. Massive army of 100,000 people is gone. I mean, we must remember, he didn't raise the largest army. Suleiman al-Qanuni, there was before him, Muhammad I rose an army by some accounts that's mentioned as being 500,000 when they marched on Romania. That is a massive army. Huge. 
So when they melted back in the e into the ether of where they came from, where were they going? Well, back to the provinces that were being threatened by the Twelvers. They had to go back there, stop the war with, and this, this according to some of the ulama that mention it, shows that it is a greater obligation to fight the people of Bid'ah than the unbelievers. And when faced with a choice between having to fight either one of them, it is more imperative that you fight the cultist than the unbeliever. It is imperative that you fight them. It is more severe that you fight them. They are worse in their harm than the unbeliever. The Jew or the Christian is clear. The Orthodox Jew in Golders Green or Stamford Hill or Brisbane or Los Angeles or New York City or Williamsburg near Brooklyn. He has the black hat, the strimmel tied around it, the big beard, the peot, the caftan jacket. He's obviously not Muslim. The Christian, whether he's Catholic or any myriad of Protestant offshoots, you can tell these people aren't Muslim and they don't say they're Muslim. What about the one that says, not only am I Muslim, this is the only true Islam. And you have a group of laymen, children, women that are vulnerable. That's why they're more dangerous. So for this reason, the Ottomans moved back. Now the 11th Khalifa came in. In 974 AH, Salim II, the 11th Khalifa of the Ottoman governance, came in. Salim II focused on administration rather than fighting and other military activities, and would often just send out his soldiers or generals to do the fighting. This was totally uncharacteristic of the Ottomans. Suleiman al-Qanuni fought in most of his own battles. There were only a few where he was too ill to attend. He fought consistently, even as an old man. And all of the pictures or portraits that are done of him, even in his old age, show this massive towering man with this big beard, well built, usually carrying a sword or one of his attendants with him carrying one. He was constantly engaged and involved in the affairs of the state. Constantly involved. To the point, to the point where even now if you look at pictures of his mausoleum, you can tell that whoever is buried in there is someone important because of the way it's built up, because of the way that it is the center of all the other buildings around it. You can tell this, whoever's here must have been some type of ruler or prince or king. I don't know who it was, but whoever they were, they were someone important. That gives you an example of understanding how Suleiman al-Qanuni was, or Suleiman al-Awwal. He was the last of the Ottomans to administrate directly for a long, long time. His reforms lasted for 300 years, systematic, right? Streamlined better pensions for the soldiers, streamlined better health care, streamlined. I mean, by this time, they had contained polio in the Ottoman territories, like how it's contained now in these countries in the Western world. Vaccinations were just, they were commonplace. Education was commonplace. You just, the way it was is you just learned three languages when you were young. That's just the way the world was. You had to learn three languages. You just did. It's the way the world was. Salim II was unable to stop the swelling Russian Empire and the grip of the Tsar increasing but was able to spread his influence by conquering El Hejaz, Yemen, and, Sp and Cyprus. Spain and Italy would be two military losses on his record, and this was partially due to not securing the Mediterranean as much as possible. In spite of all the difficulties and military setbacks, his reign was fairly stable. Now, it's mentioned that he was unable to stop the swelling Russian Empire and the grip of the Tsar. Now, the expressional use of the word Tsar came much later, but I'm using the word Tsar as just a word for the Russian em emperors in general. I'm not using it because this is when the Tsar started. I'm just using it as a word for 
the Russian emperors in general. The Russian Empire at this time was building up. It's important that we understand one of the greatest incentives for Russian expansion was when they became literate. That was one of the most important things that ever happened in Russian history. The Cyrillic alphabet was written out and invented by Saint Cyril. They call him Saint Cyril. In order to enable Russians to be able, in order to enable Russians to read the Bible. But in addition to having that alphabet to read the Bible, obviously people write poetry, they write history, and that made the Russians a literate people. They became cultured. One of the things that writing does for a people, it gives them history, depth, breadth, culture, hindsight, history, an understanding of short and long-term goals. When you have a written language, you can see the development of a people. You can't name a single outstanding civilization in the world that doesn't have some, for, some sort of writing. The Yanomamos are a people, but at, with no written alphabet, they never progressed beyond Venezuela and some of the other areas where they're in. They're almost extinct because they have no written alphabet. In the year 979 AH, the teacher of the Khalifa, Salim II, Sheikh Khawaja Ata'Allah, died after being the chief judge of Istanbul and accompanying the Khalifa many times to teach him and advise him when he had questions. Gujarat was embroiled in tribulations in 980 AH when there were street battles between the Muslims and the unbelievers. So in this time, Gujarat was almost becoming a breakaway state. It was part of, in a sense that, because a lot of territories weren't directly under Ottoman control in which they had garrisons there. But their ulama would mention the Khalifa's name in the khutbah, and they would use the Khalifa's currency. And zakah was sent to the Khalifa to distribute to the poor. By knowing this, you could see that the Khalifa was considered by them to be their leader. It wasn't necessary that the Khalifa had to be physically present there or that he had to have his soldiers physically present there. The people that would later become the Mughals, the Mughal Empire and others, they accepted his authority. They used his currency. They mentioned his name in the khutbah. They gave zakah. They gave tribute. They gave khiraj. They did all these things because he was the governor. And it's, it's from them that you found the currency, the word really gained currency, or the expression, uh, fil ard, the shade of Allah in the earth. And a lot of people, they would hear this expression today in our anachronistic projections back in time with our fake purist Islam and say, oh, astaghfirullah, this is shirk. Not realizing that the Ottomans were quoting direct from a hadith in Ibn Abi Asim, and graded as authentic by Imam Ibn Rajib al-Hanbali rahimahullah in which the Prophet sallallahu said As-Sultanu dhillullahi fil ard The Sultan, the government, the governance is the shade of Allah on earth. So they understood their role. They understood what it meant. And as a title, Sulaiman al-Awwal was actually called that not by himself but by many of his people in his time because of how great he was. He is most likely after Uthman who established the, the, the Ottoman era, the progenitor of it. Suleiman is probably the greatest Ottoman Khalifa there ever was. In 982 AH, the Khalifa of the Muslims, Salim II died. At the same time he was breathing his last, Ottoman forces had regained Tunisia from Catholic Spain. So notice what happened. The Catholic crown does the Reconquista, expels 1.6 million Muslims later on, massive slaughtering campaign, sends out Columbus. He finds the Qarib people and others and is disgusted to find that some of them are Muslim. So he comes back a year later in 1493, does slaughterings. The Spanish crown moves further into North Africa. 